Hi everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Urvashi Agrawal. I'm a legal editor and outreach coordinator at Manopatra. I would like to welcome you all to Manopatra Academy's summer webinar series. And for today's session on trademark law, we have with us Mr. Manish Jha, partner, JSA Law. Manish represents clients before Supreme Court, High Courts of various states, NCLT, NCLAT, NCDRC, DRT, DRT, and many district courts. Manish routinely advises clients with respect to shareholders' disputes, creditor disputes, insolvency and bankruptcy, IPR matters, constitutional challenges in tender matters, etc. Over to you, Manish, and we hope to have a fruitful session with you. Uh, then, uh, if uh, you have any questions for the audience, so most of them have permission to talk. It's a Zoom setting thing. Otherwise, people who cannot uh, talk in the session, please feel free to leave your answers in the Q&A and the chat session. We'll be looking at them, not a problem. Yeah, hi. So, hi, everyone. Uh, first, I sincerely ap appreciate the opportunity to speak before you all. And thank you so much for being here today. And I want to commend each of you for your interest in the trademark law as a career option. Seeing you all gathered here with a shared passion for understanding and exploring today's topic is inspiring. Now, before I touch upon the topic, let me introduce myself. And as Urvashi has introduced, I am Manish Cha, currently partner in JSA, one of the premium, premier uh, litigation firm apart from doing other corporate matters. So I'm a chemistry graduate. I did my LLB from CLC in 1999 and joined Agrawal Law Associates. At that particular point of time in 1999, Agrawal Law Associate was a small law firm. Now you all know that it has become a commercial litigation giant. So at that time I was practicing primarily in Supreme Court and in 99, 2000, 2001, I got an opportunity to brief Mr. P. Chidambaram and uh, later on Mr. R.F. Nariman in a very often cited case, and you must have uh, read about this case, Mahindra Paper Mills versus Mahindra and Mahindra Limited. So it, it came to Supreme Court. It was decided in 2002, and it became quite a famous case because, you know, despite having different field of activity, the court still granted injunction saying that you can't have a trade name which is deceptively similar to another trade name which is much famous, much reputed. Uh, 2002 onwards, I joined Justice Manmohan presently. He is a third senior most judge in Delhi High Court. And I worked with him until 2008 when he was elevated to the bench. While working with him, I did a lot of trademark litigation as he was briefed by many law firms, big and small in the Delhi High Court. And my exposure to this field there, and I started liking the field. And I developed a very keen interest because this field is intellectually very challenging. And if you read the history and if you go through it, and if you go to court, argue your own cases, you will feel that it is quite intellectually awakening and challenging too. In 2008, I joined JSA, where I got an opportunity to, the, to do the entire portfolio for PepsiCo. And PepsiCo as a beverage giant is very, very, their mainstay is their, all the trademarks, as you know, Pepsi and uh, Lay's and all other Sting recently. So if they feel that their trademark is threatened, then they go to court very fast and they seek some kind of injunction against the competitor or whoever is infringing or trying to infringe their trademark. So that is about me. Before that, now, since uh, trademark is like a badge, it shows that or it tells you that from if a Nike whoosh mark is there, everybody knows that it emanates from. Now, the next thing is that uh, I want to speak about what the trademark law is. And thereafter, I'll give a little bit of history of trademark law and then the evolution of trademark law in India. And then we have to understand as a trademark lawyer that what are the categories of trademark, which you will, when you are advising a client, you'll have to say that what kind of trademark you have to adopt. So there is a generic trademark, there is a 
suggestive trademark, fanciful trademark. So I'll come to that later on. Then whoever is interested in IP litigation. So what is the IP litigation as of today or 20 years back in India was and what is the landscape as of today? Now, thereafter, I'll touch upon nature of work, what a trademark attorney does ordinarily, and then the skill set required for a trademark attorney to succeed in this field and the challenges which he faces once he starts practicing in this field. And then I'll give some of the case laws also, a budding lawyer or a young intern or a person who is on the cusp of becoming or starting practice must read before entering this field. And then I'll give you some of the top law firms also, if you are interested in joining some law firm, you can go to these law firms or try to have some kind of internship with them. And then thereafter, you can join them as a lawyer, full-time lawyer. So what is trademark law? Now it is a, a category of property that includes intangible creations of human intellect. That's what, why it is called intellectual property. Now, intellectual property rights allow people to assert ownership rights on the outcomes of their creativity and innovative activity in the same way they can own physical property. Now, the four main types of intellectual property we all know are patents, trademarks, designs, and copyrights. Now, today I'm dealing with trademark, which is an essential aspect of intellectual property. Now, as I've stated earlier, the essential function of a trademark is to identify the source or origin of products or services exclusively. Hence, a trademark properly called indicates the source or serves as a badge of origin. That if I see a product with a swoosh mark or MAC mark, I know that this emanates from Nike or there's a three star stripes mark. I know that this shoe has emanated from Adidas. So therefore, it, it is like a badge or of origin of a particular company or a particular product. So the trademark serves to identify a particular entity as the source of goods or services. Now, history of trademark, it's very interesting that how it all started and it all started you know, years back, hundreds of years back during the Roman empire itself. The blacksmiths used, when they used to make swords, they used to have their trademarks on those swords. And then the first, which is reported one, the first trademark is of 1366, which was started by a beer company, brewery company, Stella Atois. That is in 1366. The first legislation is of 1266, Parliament of England under the reign of Henry III they passed the first legislation in 1266. Now, in 19th century, the first modern trademark law emerged. The first comprehensive trademark system in the world was passed by France in 1857 with the Manufacture and Goods Mark Act. So the Britain, as we all know, is in the forefront of all these uh, legislations. They started, they started it in 1862 by legislating an act which is called Merchandise Marks Act 1862. And for the first time, it made it criminal offense to initiate or imitate another's trademark with intent to defraud or to enable another to defraud. Thereafter, in 1875, Trademark Registration Act was passed. Now, in 1875, for the first time, they allowed formal registration of trademarks at the UK Patent Office. And the first we all know in all these industries, the brewery industry is the first one which goes for this kind of registration. And the triangular logo of past brewery is the first trademark registration. Now we all also know that there is a trademark cl classification. Now goods are classified in different categories. Now, the classification is on the basis of international classification of goods and services, which is NICE classification, which has classified trademark into trademark products, goods into 45 classes. 1 to 34 covers goods and 35 to 45 covers services. 
It is an international classification system, which is classifying goods and services for the purposes of registration of marks. So once you go to a registry to register your mark, you will have to tell that in which category or in which class. You can apply in several classes or you can restrict your registration to a particular class or a particular goods also. Now, the idea behind this system is to specify and limit the extension of intellectual property right by determining which goods or services are covered by the mark and to unify classification systems worldwide. What started happening that suppose a person or suppose a company is having registration for a particular good in a particular class. What he started doing is that he started trying to monopolize all other goods also in different classes. The, so therefore, the Supreme Court long back in 60s stopped some of them to say that what to say different class, even in one class, if there are different goods, you can't monopolize that. If you have restricted your registration to a particular good, then you have to restrict your action to that particular product itself. You can't say that in a class, if there are five, 10 products, you have monopoly over all the products and you can't let other have any kind of registration for other products for the same mark also. So that's a very important classification test is very important. In court, the first defense of the defendant always comes that I'm in a different class and therefore there is no question of any deception or confusion. You are making shoes, I'm making something else, I'm in a construction industry. So that is the classification system. Now, Indian law, if you have read, you know, the Supreme Court judgments and even the high courts, and there are only two, three high courts which are in forefront of trademark activities, that is Delhi High Court, Bombay High Court, and a little bit, you can say, Madras also. All these case laws, you will see that they have taken a huge kind of, you know, help from U.S. legislation or U.S. case laws. So in U.S., there is a legislation which is called the Lanham Act of 1946. Like our 1958 and 1999 Act of Trademark, they have Lanham Act of 1946, which was amended later on. And that is their main legislation as of today. As far as United Kingdom is concerned, they have Trademarks Act 1938. And they set up the first, first registration system based on the intent to use principle. Ordinarily, what used to happen that once you start using a product, then only you can go and register it. But in India, like in UK, even if you have not started manufacturing or producing or using the product, you can always go and register the mark with an intent that in future you use it. So once you have created a mark for yourself, you can protect it. But now they Manish, we can't hear you. The audio was stuck like five seconds ago. Is it fine now? Yes. yes. Now? I'm sorry. So where was I? I was talking about case laws, I suppose. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, sir. Okay. So that is, uh, you know, how the world fared in the trademark legislation field. Then the evolution of trademark law in India, it all started in 1940. And it's uh, very interesting that prior to 1940, there was no legislation at all. You could not have protected your trademark. So what used to happen that since in absence of any, any kind of legislation, people used to go under the specific relief act, seek a declaration that this trademark belongs to me. And on the basis of that declaration, they used to seek for injunction. So to overcome this kind of problem, 1940 Act came into picture, which was the first legislation as far as India is concerned. Then in 1958, we believed that we need a better system where we can go for, provide for registration, better protection of trademarks and prevent fraudulent marks on merchandise. 
And this 1958 Act gave the exclusive protection to the trademark owner of any, any trademark. Then in 1999, because of TRIPS obligation, a new act was enacted. That is Trademark Act 1999, which is still in force. And 1999 Act is to confer protection to the trademark user on his goods and prescribe condition on the acquisition and legal remedies for enforcement of trademark. Now this 1999 trademark has a very peculiar feature. Some of them, I'll just touch upon them. One is well-known trademark. Prior to that, there was no concept of well-known trademark. Today, there is a concept of well-known trademark. A well-known trademark is a trademark which, is, which has a very high reputation in a particular geographical location and which is known to everybody. It has a tremendous goodwill. Either the court can declare a particular trademark as a well-known trademark or you have to apply before the registrar who can declare it looking into the, your advertisements, your everything, your past uh, you know, reputation and everything to declare it as a well-known trademark. And well-known trademark has a benefit that it, it gets protection in the sense that even if the field of activity is something else of the competitor of the defendant, because you are a well-known trademark, suppose PepsiCo being a well-known trademark is only in the business of food and beverages chips and, uh, you know, uh, co uh, cola and other products. Now, if somebody starts like recently, we have done a matter in Supreme Court. Initially, it was before the district court. Somebody in Chennai was using Pepsi fireworks. It is a reported judgment you will see in uh, Punjab and Haryana High Court also. So we filed a case before district court Gurgaon because that's the first run. We got an injunction. Their argument seems to be that, look, I am in the business of firecrackers. They are in the business of, you know, food. Where is the question of confusion? Nobody will get confused. If a person is going to buy a firecracker, he'll not get, get confused that he is buying PepsiCo product. We won before the lower court because we were well-known mark. The injunction was continued by the Punjab and Haryana High Court in the appeal preferred by the other side. They lost it there also. Ultimately, they went to Supreme Court and a very interesting thing happened that when the other side started arguing, the judge said the first thing, are you telling me that you are Pepsi fireworks? This is clearly dishonest. Please go. So, you know, well-known trademarks have a lot of, lot of benefits, but a well-known trademark becomes a well-known trademark. It's a very long and arduous journey. It, you know, PepsiCo started in uh, 1940, kind of, you know, one of their product, Mountain Dew is of 1940, 1960 registration. They came into India in 2003. So, and they have spent billions of dollars on advertisement. They have protected their right. So that is one aspect of 1999 Act, which is very important. The other is Section 29.4. And I'm sure you must have read that section. Section talks about infringement action. Now, 29 for prior to 1999, and you will find case laws, everybody, all the defendants used to come to court with a defense that, look, there is a different field of activity. So to overcome that particular problem, the court enacted uh, uh, the you know, 1999 Act enacted 29, Section 29.4, which gives protection even if the product is dissimilar. And you must read that provision, Section 29.4, very, very minutely because it is in play every now and then. So this was another change, substantial change in the 1999 Act. And then Section 134, you must read it because if you start practicing, you will come... Now, what has happened that in every second matter, either the defendant or the plaintiff challenges the registration of the mark. And you all know, I'm sure, that even a registered trademark can be challenged. So even suppose I have a registration, suppose Mountain Dew is a registered mark. Somebody can file a case before the high court now to challenge the registration saying that Mountain Dew is a generic word. Or whatever the basis under section 9 and section 11 of the 
trademark act so that is also one section 134 provides that if suppose a plaintiff files a suit for infringement and the defendant challenges the registration of plaintiff's mark then the court dealing with the suit has to stay the suit frame an issue and has to wait for ipab's decision now the ipab is gone now it's the high court which decides even the validity of a registration of a mark so 134 is also though it was there patel film marshal has said lot about section 111 and other sections but 134 is also uh, 124 i'm sorry 124 is a very very important uh, provision in the new act and uh, as far as the trademark rule is concerned, initially trademark rule was of 2002. Now there is a new trademark rule of 2017. Now the trademark definition under the 1999 Act, if you see, is Section 2M and Section 2ZB defines trademark. And, and I'm not getting into what the trademark definition is. I'll only touch upon that what does a trademark do? Now it identifies the sources of your goods or services, protects the skills and intellect of the company because you have created that mark, gives an exclusive right to the trademark owner to use the mark to identify its goods or services, provides legal protection for your brand. And I can, as a trademark owner, can always commence infringement proceedings or passing off proceeding against the infringer prevents unfair competitors from using similar or deceptively similar mark, which as a trademark lawyer, you will face every day. If you are advising a very famous brand like PepsiCo, I'm advising every day, because the jurisdiction now today is Gurgaon court, every day I'm filing four or five cases. Somebody has uh, Pepsi with Pepsi, P-E-P-S-Y, somebody will P-E-S-Y, and, you know, there are other marks also, LAIS, somebody will, LAIS will keep it, somebody will have, will adopt. There's a very, you know, uh, uh, as of today, Pepsi has a very famous brand called Sting. Now, people has, have started copying Sting also. They will have S-T-R-I-N-G, they will have Stung, S-T-U-N-G, having the same red bottle. So you have to always advise your clients to file suits for infringement as soon as possible. So that is the other aspect of trademark, having trademark. Now it also, the trademark also functions to or guarantee the quality of goods. If you are buying a product of Nike, you know that the product will be good. Now it also symbolizes the value or goodwill associated with the goods and which can be assessed to, by the extent to its perception in the public mind with regard to its quality and specific source. Now, a common misconception is that having a trademark means you legally own a particular word or phrase and can prevent others from using it. However, you don't have rights to the word or phrase in general, only to how the word or phrase is used with your specific goods or services. For example, let's you, what I've stated earlier that you use a low, a trademark for your small shoe business to identify and distinguish your goods or services from others in shoe business field. But that doesn't mean that you will stop others from using similar kind of logo for a non-shoe related goods or services until unless your logo has become very reputed. As I have said that it is a well-known trademark or you have established tremendous kind of goodwill and reputation in the market. Now, there is also a difference between owing a trademark and having a registered trademark. Now, you become a trademark owner when you start using a trademark with your goods or services. Even if I don't go for registration, I can always use a trademark which I have created. You establish rights in your trademark by using it, but those rights are limited and only apply to the geographic area in which you provide your goods or services. But if you want stronger nationwide right, you must apply to register your trademark with the trademark registry. Now you are not required to register your trademark. However, a registered trademark provides broader rights and protection than an unregistered one. So what's the, what's the difference between 
you know, a mark which is registered and a mark which is not registered. A mark which is registered can file a suit for infringement. But if your mark is not registered, you can only claim passing off action, which is very difficult to prove. Infringement action are always easier because you have a statutory right in the product or in the mark. So it's always advisable that if you have a mark, you must get it registered. Now you also have seen that, you know, the symbols TM, SM and inside the circle R. So whether you have a mark registered or not, you can always use symbols like TM and SM. But only when your mark gets registered, you start using the mark R within the circle. Now I am going to touch upon a very important, you know, that's the most uh, basic element, but most fundamental for a trademark lawyer to understand that what kind of marks are there. Now courts during the course of, you know, hundreds of years of their uh, judgments, they have categorized marks into four classes. Now, and the protection accorded to these trademark is directly related to the marks distinctiveness. Now the first one, which is the strongest one is fanciful or arbitrary. Now, fanciful marks are made up words which serve as a product's brand name. Fanciful marks are inherently distinctive, thus receiving the greatest protection against infringement. So if, you, if your mark is fanciful or arbitrary and you file a case, then there is 100% chance that you will get a protection. Now, the example includes Kodak, Polaroid, Exxon. It has no dictionary meaning. So it's an arbitrary or a fanciful mark created by the owners of those marks. Now, arbitrary marks are common words used in a manner which do not suggest or describe any quality, ingredient, or characteristic of the goods they serve. If they do that, then naturally they will become generic one or descriptive, which is prohibited for registration under Section 9 of the Trademark Act. The second strongest one is suggestive mark. Now, suggestive marks connote without describing some quality ingredient or char characteristic of the product. While these marks conjure up positive images, courts consider these marks suggestive because a person without actual knowledge would have difficulty in ascertaining the nature of product that the marks represent. Suggestive marks too are inherently distinctive and fully protected. Now, say Playboy magazine, there is no, nobody will think that Playboy magazine has some kind of connection until unless you know there is a you know there is some kind of suggestion but it is not neither the neither descriptive nor generic now orange crush copper tone these are all suggestive marks and they are also inherently distinctive and they are always protected by courts when they go to infringement action before a particular now the third one is descriptive marks which are not inherently distinctive are those which identify some function, use, characteristic, size, or intended purpose of the product. Now the examples are, suppose I say five minute glue. So it is descriptive. It describes the property of the product that there is a glue which will stick within five minutes or king size men's clothing. So these are descriptive. These are not very strong marks. So when you are advising a client, you must know that whether a mark you are suggesting is a fanciful mark, suggestive, descriptive, always prefer a mark which is either arbitrary, fanciful, or even to some extent suggestive, descriptive. And the fourth one, which is the you know, least protective, is the generic one. Generic one, even if you have a, you know, say 100 years of, uh, say, reputation in the market, it will not get registered. And even if it is registered, anyone can come back and challenge it. And a court may say that this mark is an invalid mark and therefore they will. Your audio has gone again, sorry. Is it there now? I'm sorry. Yes, 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 it is. Yeah. So the last one and the least you know, in the, out of the four marks, which is the weakest one is the generic one. Never suggest your client to have a generic mark. A mark is generic when it identifies a class of product or service 
regardless of source. So this generic mark you should never, like suppose you are in the business of tailoring and you have a mark called tailor. So even if you get it registered by some chance, somebody will file a case for, uh, you know, some, yeah, it must be taken off the register and court may grant it. So these are the four kind of kinds of mark and you must remember even you are in a court advising a client that what kind of mark you have like recently and you will find you know in some time there there will be a judgment in pepsico's matter itself uh, we have a tagline called uh, for the bold for our doritos mark you will see on doritos chips there's a corn chips on the back side of it we always use for the bold now farley has copied it and they have copied it by saying that be the face for the bold so we we have filed a suit in the high court delhi high court where the matter has been argued for a very long time for the last one and a half year it was argued because change of benches and all now justice hari shankar is seized of the matter and he has kept it for orders so maybe in july we will have a judgment on that aspect also so either you know the other side argued that for the bold we can't monopolize for the bold because for the bold has some kind of meaning for the product that only a bold person can use this product or can eat this chips and they have adopted it for their be the face for the bold you have seen priyanka chopra in one of the ads for their fizz ad so they have adopted the tagline be the face for the bold our case is that you have taken our entire mark and therefore you have infringed it so it's a very longish argument all all sort of arguments were taken in fact they have challenged our mark saying that this could not have been registered in the first place and therefore section 124 comes into picture so once you go to court you are inside court you know that whether you have rightly advised the client to adopt a, adopt a particular trademark or trade name it's only when you are in court, you get to know about it. So you have, as a first step, when you are advising your client, you must be aware of all these four characterization of marks so that you always advise your client to have the best mark, which is fanciful or arbitrary. Now, I'll touch upon trademark practice, how it evolved in the sense that in 2000, how it was when I started practicing and how it is today the score for the young lawyers who are uh, today uh, there in the uh, webinar. You know, in 2001, 2002 or prior to that, there were very few law firms and it was restricted to very few lawyers. And Supreme Court had say 10 to 15 judgments only in the last 40, 50 years of their existence. And at that particular point of time, it was not also very lucrative to get the attention of prominent lawyers. Now, few law firms started concentrating on this practice area, and I'm sure everybody knows about them. And one was Anand and Anand. I think they are the, you know, the pioneers of this field. And uh, their contribution to, you know, trademark litigation case law is immense. You will see in most of the trademark cases in Delhi High Court, uh, as you know, uh, principles which have evolved from other jurisdictions is by them, are by them. So Anand Anand was at the forefront even in 2000, 2001. Then there was Ramfrey and Saga. I'm sure you have heard about it, but they were pioneering. They were in, you know, they are in since 1827, but they were only in prosecution, not much in litigation. Now, there were certain independent lawyers like Justice Pratibha Singh, who was one of the topmost lawyers in this field. And you must read her judgments because it is very erudite and, you know, it deals with all aspects of trademark law. And then Justice Manmohan Singh, these two were the prominent individual lawyers practicing IP litigation. 
And on the bench also, Justice Manmohan Singh has, has written, I don't know, more than 1,000 judgments on trademark, including the interim ones. And now today, as of today, Justice Prateva Singh, she is writing judgments, and uh, you must read it. And as of today, Justice Harishankar is also on the IPD bench. He has also written a lot of judgments, and I'm sure you must read one or two of his judgment, because to know the entire trademark litigation field, like one judgment is uh, uh, there's a uh, Bharat pay judgment. He deals with its 70 odd pages judgment, but all aspect of all the aspects of trademark law has been touched by him. And once you read his entire this entire judgment, and I'm sure you will be able to know almost all the sections and all the relevant case laws. Now, after that, you know, the skyline of IP litigation has changed completely after 2010 and 11. And as of today, if some of them, some of you are practicing in Delhi High Court or interning in some of the law firms, if you go to court, particularly to the IP division, there were three, now there are two courts only after after the vacations, you will find young lawyers arguing their cases. And it is amazing that the courts also encourage them to argue. So the scope as a trademark lawyer as of today is immense, let me tell you. Initially, there used to be 10, 15 cases handled by only some of the big law firms, some of the big independent lawyers. But now, anybody and every everybody can practice. This field is very, very lucrative also, intel intellectually challenging also. So there is a lot of encouragement to young lawyers, young professionals to join this field. Now, we are fortunate that Delhi High Court has some of the best IP judges. And if you appear before them, they will never ask that, you know, <laughs> Uh, your standing at the bar or whatever, they will let you argue. In fact, they will in, in, encourage you to argue the matter. Now, the scope in this field is unlimited. It has also, you know, witnessed a paradigm shift over the last decade. And the, and the you know, legislature has also brought a lot of changes. They have established commercial courts in 2016. Now this IP litigation, all the, all the litigations goes to commercial courts. So there is a lot of preference given to these kind of litigations now. Now of the 24, 25 high courts, five have original jurisdictions. And we all know Delhi, Chennai, Kolkata, Mumbai, they have the original jurisdiction. So practicing in these courts give you immense scope in practice in, the, in this particular area. And the volume of litigation has also gone, you know, many fold because all the companies are very, very serious about protecting their intellectual properties. And therefore, if there is even a small infringement in some remote corner of the company and they get to know about it, they run to the court to seek some kind of protection. Now, the high court jurisdiction has also, you know, widened because IPAB, which was the tribunal under the 1999 Act to get into the validity of any mark. Now it has come to the High Court after 2021 ordinance. So the High Court also deals with this, this particular aspect. So as of today in Delhi High Court itself, there are 2,500 pending commercial cases and there are 3,000 IP cases from the IPAB, which has come to Delhi High Court. So as far as the volume is concerned, the young lawyers or professionals have a lot of opportunity to pursue this field and argue or start practicing in this particular area of practice. Now, the second leg of my talk is that, what are the challenges you face as a trademark lawyer and how to overcome those challenges? But prior to that, I'll touch upon this. What is the nature of work of a trademark attorney? And I don't want to dwell upon this fact that as, a, as to become a trademark attorney, you don't have to have a special kind of degree. 
if you are a lawyer, if you are chartered, uh, uh, you know, CS, you can go and appear before uh, a trademark registry. But as far as advocate is concerned, they can practice anywhere. You have to only read some case laws. You have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, read the, the statute seriously, and you can start practicing. So as far as the requirement is concerned, there are none. You only have to a lawyer. As far as the skill sets are concerned, I'll touch upon it later on. But prior to that, I'm touching upon the nature of work a trademark attorney in its day-to-day -day practice deals with. The first one is, is the brand development and strategy. A client will always come to you to seek your advice that what kind of he is having something will, you know, he will think upon some kind of mark and he will think that his mark is unique and he will come to you and ask for some kind of advice to say that whether you can register this mark or not. And as a lawyer, if you are aware of characterization of those marks, you will know that whatever he's saying is whether bullshit or it is a, actually a strong mark. So that the first one is brand development and strategy that how to protect your client's interest. The second one is trademark registration. So as a trademark lawyer, your primary responsibility is to assist clients in registering trademarks for their products or services. You will guide them through the process of conducting comprehensive trademark searches to ensure the proposed mark is available and doesn't infringe on existing trademarks. Additionally, you will handle the application filing, respond to any kind of objection, and represent clients in the trademark registration process before the trademark registry. Now, this is also a very important aspect. What you will see once you start practicing or somebody who's practicing already must have seen that a peculiar kind of defense we encounter now every day in court. The judge asks the defendant that why have you kept this particular trademark? Now, I was doing a mark, and we, you all know there is a trade name, is a, is a Red Bull. Now, somebody had the mark called Blue Bull, having same kind of logo, but for construction industry. So the court asked the other side that you have adopted this mark. You know this Red Bull mark is quite famous. Their logo is quite famous. You have adopted everything. So <laughs> the defense was this. Ma'am, there is, uh, you know, there is no fault of mine. I gave it to a designer who designed this logo and gave it to me and I started using it. So as a lawyer, you must advise your client that you can't adopt a famous trademark and start using it for your product. And therefore, you have to, the, at the first stage, even before going for registration, you have to see that whether that mark is available or not, whether it is on the register or not, whether somebody owns it or not. The second stage is trademark prosecution. Now you will be involved in the examination and prosecution of trademark applications. This includes responding to examination reports, attending hearings, resolving any objection raised by trademark registry, once your trademark prosecution is and or you know your your mark is registered the third which is very challenging and where the uh, use of the lawyers are most is the trademark enforcement and where the litigation lawyers come into picture now trademark lawyers in india we play a very crucial role in enforcing trademark rights we help clients monitor the marketplace for any potential infringements conduct investigation, send cease and desist letter, and initiate legal actions. The fourth one is portfolio management, trademark portfolio management. As a lawyer, you may be managing and maintaining a client's entire trademark portfolio as an essential part of your job. You will assist clients in identifying valuable trademarks, advising on their protection and maintenance, and developing strategies to strengthen their trademarks. Then there is trademark opposition and, uh, you know, some kind of litigation also. And client counseling and advisory is always there. So either you can go to court to practice it as a scope of a trademark lawyer, or you can go and practice before trademark registry, or you can advise sitting as a, you know, corporate side to a client who has come for some kind of advice. Now. 
I'll touch upon, you know, uh, since we are at the fag end of our talk, I'll touch some of, you know, the topmost case laws. I'll just mention it. And you must read it before venturing into this field. The first one is NR Dongre versus Whirlpool Corporation, which is on the aspect that priority in adoption and use prevails over priority in registration. This is a very important aspect, let me tell you. Suppose I've started a mark, say 50 years back, but I have not registered it. And somebody in 2019 get it registered, files an infringement suit against me. Because I'm a prior user, and if I'm able to establish in the court that I'm a prior user, he will not get the injunction. So this is one important facet. So there are two more cases, which is Neon Laboratories and S. Sayed Mohideen versus Solochna Bai. The second one is Vishnu Das Trading versus Wazir Sultan Tobacco, Tobacco Limited. There is another one which is Nandini Deluxe. The third one is on the aspect that registration of a composite mark not to confer exclusive right to individual non-distinctive parts of the mark, which is Ashok Chandra Rakit. This is 1955 case. Then there is a case, Kerala Healthcare, which is one of the most celebrated ones. Then Lakshmi Kant Patel versus Chetan Bhai Shah, which is 2002. Then on jurisdiction, jurisdiction aspect, which is Patel Field Marshal. And uh, often cited cases, Medas Ayajin. We cite this case to say that in cases of infringement, either of trademark or of copyright, an injunction must follow. If I am able to convince the court that they have adopted the identical trademark as of mine, then the injunction must follow. So these are some of the top most uh, case laws which you must read. And the last one I'm saying is Kaviraj Pandit, which is on the aspect that what is the difference between infringement action and the passing of action. Then if you are in this practice, you are uh, still in college and want to specialize in this field, then I'll suggest that you should intern with any of these top seven, eight law firms, which are in this field for a very long time. Some of them are new, but we all know about them. The first one is Anand and Anand. I don't have to say anything about them. And they have their offices in New Delhi, Noida, Chennai, and Mumbai. And they have all sort of practices from corporate to litigation to advisory, everything. The second one is Khetan and Company, which is also a full service firm. And they have practitioners all, all across the country, Mumbai and New Delhi. The third one, which is a very old one, is RK Devan and Company. Ramfrey Sagar, I have already talked about. As far as the new one is concerned, a very aggressive firm, Sai Krishna and Associates. They are doing quite well in this field. Lal and Sethi is another name. And Intel Advocate, I'm sure you all have heard its name. And there is a new firm, not new in the sense that uh, it started in 1996, but it is uh, run by now two brothers, which is Sim and Sam. Seven. And uh, yeah, and the two brothers are quite aggressive and they are representing uh, Bharat Pay in the litigation. And there are several litigations. So these are the top law firms which you can look for joining. And prior to that, you can, you know, intern with them. And as far as the internship is concerned, we all know that what the process is, how you can intern. Uh, before ending, I'll just touch upon you know, some of the challenges which you may face as a trademark lawyer and how to overcome. The first stage is the client interaction. You know, as a lawyer, or today, or uh, if you are practicing in court, or young attorneys, or if you are an intern or a, a law student, tomorrow you will start practicing. The first stage is client interaction, which is the uh, which is very very important. You have to prepare for the interview with the client. Don't go without any kind of preparation. Familiarize yourself with the basis, basic of trademark law and the specific details of the case. Have a list of questions ready. Establish your rapport with the client. 
gather all sort of background information from the client, ask about their business, brand, history, product services, previous trademark related activities, identify their trademark assets, and then assess their potential infringements that who all can or are infringing their mark. Discuss their business goals, conduct the trademark search, discuss trademark registration, address their concerns and questions, outline the legal process, discuss their roles also. Sometimes what I, we feel that the client don't give you all the information, but, and once you go the, into the court, you realize that documents are missing. The court asks you to establish that you are a prior user. And at that particular time, you feel that, oh, I don't have the documents to show that I'm a prior user. So you have to discuss clients role in the sense that they must provide all the documents they have, all the information they have. And the last but not the least, as a lawyer, you must provide the structure because that's your bread and butter. So that is as far as the client instruction is, you know, interaction is concerned. The second stage, which is important before going to court, is preparing briefs. For that, you have to see that whether the whether the mark is a valid mark or registered trademark. You have to establish in the court, and for that, you have to establish in the pleadings that there is a likelihood of confusion between the two marks, evidence of infringement presence, advertisement, priority of ownership, kind of damages you are seeking, cease and desist notices you have given. And the last is jurisdiction. Before filing a case, you must find out whether a particular court where you are moving has a jurisdiction or not. Most of the cases you will find that after filing the case, the court asks you to say that you, Mr. Counsel, this court has no jurisdiction. And then it becomes huge embarrassing for you to explain to the client. So therefore, must ensure that the court which you are moving as a jurisdiction. And the last is timely action. Don't delay the action. Advise, advise your client that as soon as they come to know about the infringement or passing off, they must leave. Otherwise, even a short delay, there is a problem. You will not get any action. And then, you know, two years, three years will happen and there is a problem, which has happened with us in one of the cases where we delayed filing the suit five months. And thereafter, the other side said that, you know, there is a delay. I've already established my practice. The court said that, okay, then you file your reply and I will decide the initial application. And I will not. So the timely action is one of the very, very important aspects. Then thereafter, the third stage is preparation for briefing the counsel. Either you argue your own case or you brief a senior counsel. That also you have to familiarize yourself with all the facts, analyze the legal elements, conduct the trademark search, establish the likelihood of confusion. And the most important aspect is address potential differences. Even before going to court, you must know that what kind of defenses the other side will have. And you meet all those challenges with the case law, with the relevant sections, because the court will ask you those questions. So as a trademark attorney or as a, or as a litigation lawyer, you must be prepared to answer those questions the, by, by the court. And the last is you must rehearse and prepare for a lot. The fourth stage, which is the last one in the life of a particular litigation, is filing of written submissions. What I have felt in my years of practice is that most of the time, if you write a written submission, point-wise, concise one, then the court may follow it. And the court may grant you a judgment on the basis of your written submissions. So always as a trademark attorney or a litigation lawyer, whatever field you are taking, after arguments, you must give whatever three pages, five pages, four pages, written submissions to the court to help them to write a judgment. So these are the four stages which are important for a trademark attorney or for any, any lawyer 
the bear of our case and adieu. So that brings to the end of my talk. If you have any questions for the next five minutes, you can ask me on the uh, school challenges or whatever. Okay. So uh, audience, the floor is open for questions and most of you have the uh, permission to talk enabled. So you can unmute yourself or you can simply leave your question in the Q&A box. Sir, I have one question in the chat. Will this be possible for you to uh, tell us that some, since you uh, listed the names of the cases, so somebody is asking for the name of the case, which you said runs over 50, 70 pages yes, and covers yes. important sections in case law under that. Yeah, this is uh, the judgment of Bharat P. Bharat P judgment. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? The we have a couple of minutes, otherwise. Uh, sir, uh, may I ask one question? Yeah, yeah. Sir, I, I just uh, wanted to know that if uh, if, if that uh, trademark infringement is happening, then whether the client comes to you uh, to law firm with the uh, their uh, with the information, or it is the uh, law firm who is managing their portfolio has to find out. Yeah, so it's a, uh, you know, a very pertinent question. Sometimes what happens that uh, a law firm, which is dealing with the entire portfolio of a, of a particular client, have their investigators in the field. And they come to know about some kind of infringement because the client may have its, you know, footprints across the country, but they don't have the eyes and ears in the entire country. So we have the investigators who find out that whether some kind of infringement is going on or not, or if it comes to their notice, they bring it to our you know, attention. We write to the client and ask them that, you know, this is this, this is happening, whether you want to proceed or not. And then we suggest advice that whether the mark is deceptively similar or not, what kind of uh, you know, challenges you will face in the court, what is the, uh, you know, the chances of success. So these kind of things happen. This is one aspect. The other one is some kind, you know, sometimes client also comes to know about it. Or client wants to, uh, a very, very aggressive client wants to pursue some kind of litigation against a competitor. Suppose somebody has started some kind of brand and some competitor after two, three years has, has started similar kind of brand. So the client comes to you to file an infringement action against them. So it happens both ways. We point it out to the client, and sometimes client also they come. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead. Sir, can I use a generic term? Um, but the properties of my product is different. Like the case of an apple, of we can take example of both. Can that be the case? So you are uh, not able to hear your question clearly. No, audible. Uh, audible, but not very clearly. Can you please type your question in the chat, maybe? Sure, sure, I will type. Yeah. Now I can see a question by Mansi Gupta. I'm a new trademark attorney and deals with registration process only, but I plan to be part of litigation team as well. Tried at few places, but they seek for experience in litigation related trademark, how to overcome the scene. I'm sure once you have started as a trademark attorney in the registration process, there you must be facing oppositions also. And once you start dealing with them, you will get to know about the case laws and what kind of you know uh, obstacles a particular client faces. And then after some time, you can only, you can of course apply to different law firms who specializes in this field. And naturally, some of the big law firms, a part of their team, deals with the registration process only. So you will have experience there, and thereafter you can always join as a litigator with their litigation. So if you are doing this practice. In the sense, as a trademark attorney, 
for the registration process of different companies, trademarks. Continue for some time, have some experience, and I'm sure it is a relevant experience for any litigator who is doing this fact. Sir, uh, uh, we are, you know, way over time and I not, do not want to waste a lot of time, but Anish has just typed his question, the person who was who we were not able to hear. Uh, can I use sure. can I use a generic term when the properties of my product are completely different? Like suppose I'm making a car brand and I name it as Wolf. So can I do that? Yeah, like uh, you know, the best example is Apple. Mm -hmm. Apple is a generic word. Yeah. So you can do that. But tomorrow, if somebody is using Apple as Apple, you can't stop him. Because it is generic. But Apple for computer is naturally, you can't do it. So you can do that. Okay, great. Because it becomes arbitrary. You are using it for some other thing. You know, for like us, we are using for the bowl. Nobody would know that for the bowl is for what, what kind of product. Until unless I tell him it is for chips. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, you mentioned that uh, in one of your cases, you delayed the filing by five months and uh, you were not granted the relief. And they said that other party has established its practice or something. So can you please dwell upon that? Yeah, that, yeah sure. Uh, so what happens that, you know, the trademark action, as far as the infringement action or the suit is concerned, it is a play of the first day. You get the injunction or you don't get the injunction. So the ex parte injunction is very, very important. But if you delay the process, suppose you come to know about the infringement today. And after six months, you approach the court. The court will ask you, when did you come to know about it? You will say six months back. They will say that you are not very you know, serious about your mark. Then let me hear the other side. They will call upon the other side to file reply. Then there is a rejoinder. It will take two years before the argument takes place for the infringement action. So always go to the court as soon as possible. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This uh, looks like a good place to wrap this up for today. I don't Thanks see any a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Manish. It was lovely hearing you. And I'm sure the audience also learned a lot. I also learned a lot from the session. And we hope to do this again soon, something like this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank and you. all the best for your career. Thank you. Thank you.